Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Simply Susan, where we explore historical sewing, cooking, and living. Today, we are at the Tuscarora Academy Museum and the Lower Tuscarora Presbyterian Church, where I had the opportunity to take part in the events that you just saw on the flyer on your screen. We're going to talk a little bit more about the history of Juniata County, and we will also hear from two speakers who are members of the Juniata County Historical Society, as well as meet with Jess Geyer, who was absolutely instrumental in the um, updating of the Tuscarora Academy Museum. Juniata County is located in the state of Pennsylvania. As of the 2010 census, the population was 24,636. The county seat is in Mifflin Town. Juniata County was historically a part of Cumberland County and later Mifflin County. Juniata County was formed on March 2nd, 1831 from parts of Mifflin County. It is named after the Juniata River. The word Juniata itself is a Seneca word that means either people of the standing stone or blue waters. There are four boroughs and 13 townships in Juniata County. There are five areas in Juniata County that are protected by the Central Pennsylvania Conservancy and 59 natural heritage sites in the county. The first European settlers arrived in Juniata County in the 1750s. The county has historically been part of Mifflin County and before that, Cumberland County. The cemetery that I am currently in is the Lower Tuscarora Presbyterian Cemetery, and we will hear more about this from one of our speakers. Hi, everybody. It is Simply Susan from Simply Susan Historical Sewing, Cooking, and Living. And I am here today with Jess Geyer from the Juniata County Historical Society. And she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, Juniata County and this wonderful museum that we're in. So this is the Tuscarora Academy Museum. Um, it actually was an academy. It was built in 1816 as a church. Uh, when the church built a new building, we uh, they gave it to the Tuscarora Academy to use, and uh, the second floor was added, which you can see outside. You can see where they raised the roof line. Um, after its years as an academy, uh, it many, many years later, ended up uh, coming to the Juniata County Historical Society and we use it as our museum to house all of the awesome items that people from our county have given us over 90 years of existence. Um, over the years though, um, certain things have been put in storage or it wasn't known or remembered or written down or recorded where we got it or anything about it. So um, at the beginning of COVID season, I found myself with some extra time and I started volunteering out here, did an extensive inventory, uh, went through 90 years worth of paperwork trying to marry the item with what was in old meeting minutes and things like that and was able to then take that. Once we knew what we had, we were able to group things into new and better exhibits, get things out of storage, and make new exhibits. For instance, this fireplace behind us was completely dismantled, uh, and it was with a couple others up in a storage room, and come to find out, we had gotten four fireplace surrounds from our county jail that was built in 1833, and when there was renovations done in like 1980-ish, we got four of those. We only had one on display, and they thought we only got one, and in that paperwork, I found that we actually got four. We knew what these ones were in storage, and our awesome handyman, uh, Austin Willi, he put them together, and we already to use them in exhibits now. So this one, is, this is our little photography studio exhibit. So we have uh, giant cameras, and lots of old cameras and pictures and different audio-visual things, uh, and so it just kind of made sense to stick this one there. <laughs> That sounds great, and I know I mean, Jess has been absolutely instrumental with getting the museum to where it is now. I remember coming here one time uh, sometime in the 90s with my parents. Uh, my father's family is all from Juniata County, and we'll talk about that more at another time uh, when we go visiting some of the other sites in Juniata County. But 
I remember being here one time so many years ago. I don't remember too much about it, but I believe that all of these changes have come from this lady and all of her hard work. So yeah, we're just gonna keep walking around the museum and check things out. And Jess, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Let me introduce myself. My name is Reverend George Washington Thompson, and I want to welcome you into this beautiful spot here. This spot is uh, was my final resting place. In fact, uh, there's a, a congregation here erected a monument here for me on my grave, uh, and it's right up the hill. You can see it if you look straight up the hill here. You might have to up one side or the other of this tree here, but there's a monument up there shaped like the, the Washington Monument, a taller one. Does everybody see that up there? That's, uh, that's the monument they, they put up for me. And I think it's kind of fitting that that top of that monument is shaped like the Washington Monument since I was named after our first president, George Washington Thompson. <clears throat> I was not a native to this area, uh, but uh, I, I ended up coming here in this lovely spot and spent uh, 17 very exciting years. Uh, unfortunately, the last 17 years of my life. But uh, I'd like to tell you about, a little bit about my life, uh, the, especially the life here in academia. Now, I was born in, in New Jersey on October the 20th of 1819, almost exactly 201 years ago. Uh, so uh, I was born there and I went to college there. I went to Rutgers College, and today it's Rutgers University. I'm sure you've heard of that. And I went on to uh, Princeton University Seminary to train to be a minister. Now, sometimes whenever you, um, uh, when, you enter, when you enter the ministry, you don't always find a, a congregation uh, that right away. You, know, you, you have to look for work. But uh, I did some filling in for churches that didn't have a pastor until I finally received a call uh, to be a minister. My first church was in Danville, Pennsylvania, and I was there a short time. You probably know where that is, over on the other side of the Susquehanna River. And from Danville, uh, I went on to an, another uh, village on that side of the river, to uh, Mifflinburg. And from Mifflinburg, I'm sorry, I think Mifflinburg's on this side of the Susquehanna River. But then I went on uh, from there to uh, New Berlin. And it was New Berlin that I was ordained as a pastor. And it was in New Berlin that I married uh, a, a beautiful young lady, uh, Mary Ann Stillwell, who became my wife. And it was uh, all, then after that, there was also, I almost forgot because it was a short time, I also preached at a brand new church in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And then in the spring of 1847, I did receive an invitation, I received a call from the people at Lower Tuscarora Presbyterian Church. So I arrived here that spring, and uh, I, I'm very glad that that call came to me uh, because the next 17 years, although they were last, as I said, were the most exciting. Uh, when I arrived here in 1847, this village was much different than it is today. Uh, today, you know, you drive through here, if you blink your eyes, you might miss it. It's kind of a sleepy little village. It wasn't that way then. Uh, at that time, it was a growing community. It already had a post office, a general store, a uh, blacksmith and undertaker, and, and just a, a couple of miles from here, <clears throat> another little town that today is called Walnut. Uh, there was a hotel there. And, stores there, so it was a thriving community. And not just uh, businesses, there was also an educational institution, the Tuscarora Academy. And the same year I arrived, 1847, a school for girls opened up, the Tuscarora Female Seminary, which was right up at the top of the hill here. <coughs> and um, that, uh, that school was actually an idea. It had, uh, it was formed by a man named Alexander Patterson. And again, it survived for about 25 years before, uh, they had some financial difficulties with it over the years, but it did last until about 1872. And then uh, the Tuscarora Academy, when that closed, they began uh, accepting female students too. But backing up, uh, when I arrived here again uh, that year, it was a growing community, and this uh, Tuscarora Academy that, uh, it was born as uh, an idea in the head of Reverend uh, McKnight Williamson, 
who was a pastor here before me. And he began in 1836 the Tuscarora Academy, and it met in um, his home and the homes of other uh, congregations. Up with that idea, and they completed that in 1849, and it was um, at a cost of $6,000. That's a lot of money back then. And now, today, that would be about uh, about $123,000. Still, today's dollars, I think we'd all like to build something that size for that price today. But anyway, back to my story. I'm kind of out of character. But uh, they built that building, and they closed the old church, the stone church down the hill. You're going to be there. That's now. Uh, what remains of the Tuscarora Academy. And uh, that building served a congregation for more than 30 years, from 1816 uh, on. And you'll hear a little bit more about some changes that were done to the church whenever they uh, took the academy took that over. So uh, I'll let you wait till you get down there, and you can see some pictures and some things there that will explain a little bit more about that renovation. So here at uh, Academia, things were really growing. The congregation went from 100 members to 700 members, from 30 families to 320. That was a time, uh, uh, anywhere from 1800 on, congregation, there was a period called the Second Great Awakening, and then also a time called the Great Revival. So people were taking a great interest in churches, and they had rather large congregations, so they needed bigger buildings. But I thought that my education at Rutgers and Princeton prepared me very well for my ministry not just being a minister, but being an educator. In 1852, I was named as head of the Tuscarora Academy. And I had uh, studied uh, very much the Greek and Latin. It was one of my favorite subjects. And I enjoyed transcribing that uh, into English, you know. A lot of people would find that dry, but I really enjoyed that. And that was helpful, I think, here with the students. And uh, not only did I uh, enjoy uh, teaching, but also uh, giving spiritual advice to the young men and became friends with many of them and even corresponded with some after they left here. And the nation, as the time went on, especially uh, and uh, got into the 1850s, and became more and more divided. And of course, I'm sure you remember learning in school about the Great Civil War, which uh, opened in 1861. And uh, in 1863, the greatest battle of that Civil War, the bloodiest battle, was fought in a town about 70 miles from here, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And that resulted in about seven, about 51,000 casualties. That casualties means those that were killed or captured or wounded. And uh, I couldn't do much for the dying men, but those wounded men troubled me very deeply, knowing that some of the same, same young men that I instructed here on both sides of the war on north and south because there were southerners that attended this school here you know, students from from alabama and delaware and, and maryland and, and other southern states and maryland i know i mentioned some border states so everywhere south of here so uh, i was worried that maybe these men would even fight against each other and i wondered who were those men lying on the field suffering so i went to Gettysburg and i joined up with the christian commission the united states christian commission and the U.S. Sanitary Commission were sort of like the Red Cross today. Although the, uh, the Sanitary Commission was made up mostly of paid doctors and things, <clears throat> the Christian Commission was all volunteers. So I went there and volunteered my services, giving spiritual uh, uh, help to those wounded soldiers and, and also helping in, and caring for them in any way I could. And those field hospitals were all over the battlefield. I was with the Second Corps Army uh, Field Hospital near Rock Creek, which is near the visitor center there today. <clears throat> and the hospitals were just tents. They were crude, and uh, they did what they did, uh, could for immediate attention to these soldiers and to, you know, to maybe do amputations and other things and stop the bleeding until they could be transferred to bigger hospitals. <clears throat> and I was um, eventually, uh, that field hospital closed and I returned here. And I got back here in, oh, I'd say late August of, of 1863. <clears throat> but as I got back here, I wasn't feeling well. And as time went on, I, I, my condition worsened. The doctors told me it had uh, something to do with my liver. And I know now, from what you know, you know about <coughs> medicine today, 
that I had actually contracted a contagious, probably contracted a contagious disease when I was there at Gettysburg, hepatitis. And that's very contagious, but you know, that war, more men died of disease than they did of bullets. And the, the leading cause of death was dysentery and acute diarrhea. Uh, and then uh, pneumonia and other diseases. And of course, hepatitis was one of them. And that's, uh, that's sad. But uh, I go back here, fortunately nobody else in my family caught that, but it eventually led to my death on January 28th of 1864, just about six months after I returned from Gettysburg. My, uh, fortunately, the congregation uh, was able to look, look after my wife and, uh, and my two children, but I was laid to rest here. But uh, I thought it was important to come back to you, to tell you a little bit about how a thriving community this was and how important education was. Maybe give you a little uh, more meaning when you think about why this is called academia, Pennsylvania. So thank you for your time. The man that you just heard speak is Austin Willi. He is a member of the Juniata County Historical Society and a retired educator in the area. Here are a few views of the church that you heard him speak about. I'll introduce you to, to Bailey, and she's going to tell you about some other members of the Thank congregation you. that are here. Hi, everybody. My name is Bailey Imes, and welcome to the Lower Tuscarora Presbyterian Church and Cemetery. So the original church building was erected in 1816, and it was one of the earliest churches in the Tuscarora Valley. That building then became part of the Tuscarora Academy, and is now where we have our museum. Um, whenever the Tuscarora Academy began, the Lower Tuscarora Presbyterian Church moved up here. This building was erected in 1849. So the land for this new brick church and the cemetery was donated by Merchant John Patterson, who opened the first store in our area. You'll hear more about him and his son John later, because today I will be talking about notable people buried here in the cemetery, um, as well as some ghost stories at the end. <laughs> so we have several Revolutionary War veterans buried here. Captain Thomas Harris is one of them. Uh, he was born in 1695 in Ireland after his family fled Scotland. Um, and he came here to the Americas in seven, the 1720s where he met and married Mary McKinney. They settled in Elizabethtown and until 1751 um, operated a tavern called Sign of the Bear, and that still stands today. His wife passed in 1770, and Thomas then moved to Doyle's Mills to be near his daughter Mary. Here he bought seven, I'm sorry, 300 acres and developed a gristmill, sawmill, and distillery. He also had large investments in Native American trading, and Thomas was the uncle of John Harris, who founded Mifflin Town. He died at age 106, having lived through three centuries, being born in 1695 and dying in 1801. Buried here is... You said that that one place was still here. Is it still open? Um, I'm it, not it still sure. Standing? It's still standing, okay. um, and I don't know if they have anything outside to commemorate um, the history. Yeah, it is still standing. I don't know if it's an operating tavern or not. Is that Elizabethtown? Or is it yes, Elizabethtown. Okay. So there's also Colonel Thomas Turbert here. Um, he was born in Ireland in 1741. Thomas came to America around 1774. Shortly after, he entered the American Revolution and he rose to the rank of Colonel. Thomas married Jane Wilson and the two settled at the in the Tuscarora Valley along with his brother James. It is said that Thomas built the county's first tannery. After the end of the Revolutionary War, he continued fighting by engaging in expeditions against Native Americans. In 1815, Turbert Township was founded and named after him, mm -hmm. noting his brave, diligent, and humane manner. He died in 1820 at age 78. Buried here is also Captain William A. Patton. He was born in Carlisle in 1758. When he was five, his grandfather William was um, harvesting <laughs> crops in the Spruce Hill area and was killed by Native Americans. Four years after that, William's mother, Mary, died of, si died of a sickness. And he, his father, John, and two siblings remained in the Carlisle area um, because they thought in a more populated area they'd be safer from a Native American attack. He grew up educated and filled with the spirit of religious and political liberty. To use his own words, his soul was on fire with it. So he enlisted and served in the Revolutionary War when he was just shy of 17. He rose in rank, and by the end of the war, he was a captain. He married Margaret Silvers, and in 1788, they moved to Juniata County and settled in the Spruce Hill area. After Margaret's death, he married Isabella Young Patterson. He died in 1848, just weeks shy of his 90th birthday. 
and William, his second wife, and several children are all, all buried here. We also have Captain William Graham here. I have some photos. This was his house. We think it is a, one of the houses on Route 75, but we're not totally sure. Um, Captain William Graham was born in 1753, likely in Ireland. Um, William was a captain in the Revolutionary War. After the war, he served in Kentucky against the Native Americans on the frontier. It is said that he built the first stone building in the area, as pictured there, and offered a flat operated a flour mill and distillery. He died in 1813. His wife Fanny is also buried here. You can see their grandson Edward's handmade wooden ice skates at the Academy Museum whenever you go down there. Other Revolutionary War vets here include Patrick Fry, who was allegedly present during the harsh winter at Valley Forge with George Washington, and Captain John Stewart, whose wife Margaret was the daughter of John Harris, founder of the one of my favorite people buried here is Merchant John Patterson. Merchant John Patterson was born in 1763 in Bucks County. When he was a teenager, his large size made him look so much older than he was. In his early, his early teens, he joined his father and uncles to fight in the militia in the Revolutionary War. When he was 15, his father died from a sickness that he got in the Revolutionary War. And sometime after that, John began a merchandise business, utilizing Pennsylvania's rivers to transport his goods. On one trip, a bad ice storm caused his boat to freeze in the river. He knew his uncle Alexander Patterson, who was also buried here, and settled in the Tuscarora Valley, somewhere near he was stuck, where he was stuck, so he traveled there on foot. His uncle convinced him to stick around to open a store because at the time, the closest store here was all the way in Carlisle. By the 1790s, Merchant John had settled in academia and started a store. Merchant John is so important because he donated $2,000 to start the Tuscarora Academy, as well as the land um, which the campus was, was built on. For generations, members of his family attended the Tuscarora Academy, and Merchant John became quite wealthy for his day. Um, when he died, he operated 14 farms, 3 mills, and a large estate, which is pictured here. It is now known um, as the Beaver Farm. It's, um, if you're on the same road that the covered bridge is on, you can take go up it um, at the very top of the steep hill um, straight by the road. It's technically on Groninger Valley Road though. So Merchant John's son, who is also named John Patterson, was born in 1809 in academia. After his father's death, he moved to the Peru Mills land that his father owned and operated a mill, built and operated a tannery, and started a store. John served as Justice of the Peace for a number of years. He was an accountant, a surveyor, and a geologist who assisted in a geological survey near where he lived. He was scientific in his agricultural methods, both as to land and his crop management. John was married to a lady named Eleanor Van Dyke. That's her picture there. Um, she was known as a woman of more than ordinary beauty, graceful, and intelligent. Two of their sons were Civil War veterans. Their names were James and Robert, and their daughter, Isabella, married Southerner David Stone, who served as principal at the Tuscarora Academy for a decade. You should ask Jess, whenever you're down at the Academy, what um, happened between David Stone and his brother-in-law. It's pretty interesting. Oh, I think he served that, didn't <laughs> John and Eleanor's son, Willie, was born in 1842. He only lived a few years, and his tiny cane is part of our collection at the Academy. Eleanor died in 1865, and even though he lived 26 years beyond her death, John never remarried. A few other interesting people that are buried here include Captain Jeremiah Frank House. He served in the Civil War, leaving Pennsylvania to travel through Native American territory with his own horse um, to, the, to Kansas to fight on the Union side to help make sure that Kansas did not enter the Union as a slave state. His grandson was Fred Frank House, who was a junior, who was junior out of county born and raised, went on to play Major League Baseball. To find out more about him, then we go to the Academy. So another interesting person buried here is Joseph Brown. That was his home and place of business. He was a cabinet maker and undertaker. So these two professions often found themselves thrust together just out of necessity. And he was the first of five generations that continued the Brown funeral home tradition today.
He was a professor at Tuscarora Academy, and when the building became Beale Township High School for four years, he served as principal. Here he met the woman he would marry, Rachel Brown, who was um, Joseph Brown's granddaughter. And Samuel went to China for missionary work and to teach. Later, Rachel joined him, and the two were married in China, where they served for several years. After returning to the U.S., Samuel held several positions in Harrisburg schools. In 1934, they returned to Juniata County, where Samuel served as school district superintendent. He died in 1969, and Rachel died in 1974. They're both buried here. Judge, jo Judge Joseph Pomeroy is also buried here. He began what is today known as the Juniata Valley Bank. He also serves president of the Juniata Agricultural Society. Josiah L. Barton is also buried here. He, uh, he was a veteran of the Civil War, and after the war, he began the first general store in Pleasant View. Um, you're going to be able to see a lot of the items from his store whenever you tour the town area um, in the Academy Museum. And the last person I have to talk about was Alexander Patterson. He was born in 1796, and he was the man who began the female seminary. He died in 1869. Now for the part that seems to be one of the more popular parts of the tour. Um, local ghost stories about the girls' seminary, the cemetery, and the church. So there have always been rumors that a male employee at the girls' seminary murdered several students. Some say it was a gardener, some say it was a professor. Um, but nothing has ever been proven that this happened. And many have claimed to see the ghost of this man when the seminary was still standing above the cemetery. Um, and they'd say that he'd be crying because he felt guilty about what he did. There have also been claims that people visiting the ruins of the seminary could hear the voices of young girls laughing and singing London Bridge. For years, high schoolers would hold parties in the seminary, and many said that they would hear footsteps in the floors above them, but to their knowledge, nobody would be up there. There have also been several experiences of people parking by the seminary and later having trouble getting their cars to start running whenever they were ready to leave. Others have complained about their radios going to static and seeing lights flashing throughout the building. And as for the cemetery, some claim to see large black phantom hounds running around the cemetery. And people have brought Ouija boards, have told me about that, and just said that the experience was so scary they were afraid to talk about it. So my favorite ghost story isn't really a ghost story. Um, people used to see a tall, dark, mysterious figure. They thought it was a male roaming around the cemetery all in all black and then eventually he would take a rest on the church steps people thought it was some supernatural figure but in reality it's our old reverend um, that was in the late 80s early 90s he had a dark sense of humor and he'd dress in all black and then he'd go for a nightly jog whenever teenagers would be out here partying and he'd just scare them and then he'd take a rest on the church steps <laughs> so reverend roberts fooled a lot of people but um yeah so does anyone have any experiences at the church or the seminary? I like to hear if anyone has any spooky stories of just weird things that have happened. No? <laughs> okay. All right, so that concludes my part of the tour. Um, if you would like, you can head down to the academy. Jess will meet you there. You can walk or drive. It's up to you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. While you enjoy some scenes of the exhibits that are in the museum, let me just keep telling you a little bit more about the history of Juniata County. In 1798, when Mifflin County was formed, the Pennsylvania State Legislature delegated three men to explore the townships of the new county to find a central place for the location of the county seat. Colonel James Johnson and Matthew Wilson selected the present site of Mifflin Town, then the plantation of John Harris for the seat of justice. The northern townships negated this decision and the county seat was removed to Lewistown in 1790. The debate continued until February of 1813, when the first bill for the erection of a new county was introduced in the Senate an act erecting that part of Mifflin County, which lies east of and below the Black Log Mountain and Long Narrows into a separate county. Finally, after 19 long years of struggling, a bill was introduced by John Cummins 
a member of the legislature of Mifflin County, to form a new county. The act, which was approved by the then Governor Wolf, was approved on March 2nd, 1831, and thus Juniata County was formed. Along with the museum, there are many other sites in Juniata County that are of significant historical value. The Book Indian Mound is a historic site in Beale Township. Some reports indicate that this site has been known since 1889. The site consists of the remnants of a burial mound and a prehistoric village. The Pomeroy Academia Covered Bridge is another important site in Juniata County. The bridge, which measures 274 feet and long, 4 inches long, is the longest remaining covered bridge in Pennsylvania. It crosses the Tuscarora Creek near Academia. It was built in 1902 by James N. Groninger. The bridge is a double-span burr arch design. So thank you for joining me in this journey across Juniata County. If you have any questions, please leave me a comment. Also, please check out the links in the description box below. Thank you.